Vivian Thomas spent his entire life following and trying to exemplify his father's belief. I learned the lesson, which I still remember and try to adhere to, whatever you do, always do your best. Vivian Thomas, an African-American surgical assistant with no formal education, triumphed over the tragedies of discrimination by creating innovative surgical tools which led to groundbreaking medical techniques for heart surgery. I would want people to understand that he was the most kind and the most steadiest person I believe I have ever met. Thomas was never given credit for his ideas and efforts in the medical field. He was forgotten. Thomas worked alongside Dr. Alfred Blaylock. Dr. Blaylock was praised and honored for his medical expertise and Thomas was a shadow in the background. Thomas endured many obstacles, however, they never undermined his determination to excel in the medical community. His story began in New Iberia, Louisiana on August 29, 1910. Masio Thomas married Mary Eaton and they had their fourth son named Vivian. After a few years, Vivian's parents decided to move to Nashville for more job opportunities. In the city, Vivian's father worked above and beyond to supply the needs for his family. But, as an African American, he had few options. Thomas's father taught him the trade of carpentry and began working after school, saving every penny. With his savings, he planned on starting school in the fall at Tennessee State College. He wanted to make a difference and develop methods in which he could cure sick patients. His lifelong goal was to become a doctor, but tragically, when the stock market crashed in the fall of 1929, it left not only his finances dissolved, but also his dreams. Frantically searching for work after he lost his job, Thomas found himself working as a carpenter. Unfortunately, that position was terminated. Without the ability to pay for medical school, he had to find a job so his family could survive. Eventually, he found employment at Vanderbilt University as a lab technician. It is here that his partnership with Dr. Blaylock began. The moment Dr. Blaylock met him, Blaylock knew exactly what he needed and wanted in order to fulfill his experiments and research. This began Thomas's lifetime partnership with Blaylock in the field of cardiovascular surgery, a partnership that would influence the world still today. Blaylock stated upon hiring Thomas, As time goes on, I'm getting more and more involved with patients and hospital duties. I want to carry on my research and laboratory work and I want someone in the laboratory whom I can teach to do anything I can do and maybe do the things I can't do. However, there was a setback in the situation. Thomas was employed as a janitor. He made little to no pay with a salary of $12 a week. Not only was the pay slim, he also received no recognition because of the color of his skin. During this time, World War II was raging at its peak. Soldiers wounded on battlefields were often victims of toxic shock. Thomas had worked alongside Blaylock for 15 years and during that time carried out experiments on toxic shock. With Thomas's assistance, Blaylock was able to show that a toxic agent was provoked by rapid blood loss and could be reversed by tr blood transfusions. This idea saved not hundreds or thousands, but probably millions of lives. Helen Tosic was a well-known pediatric cardiologist in Baltimore who helped change the face of medicine. She was intrigued by medical condition that affected babies and young children. Tosic approached Dr. Blaylock concerning babies being born with a heart defect called Tetralogy of Fela, what was more commonly known as Blue Baby Syndrome. The defect was caused by malformations of the heart. He had to push it, didn't you? Oh, and I kicked that into him and I said, Dr. Blaylock, like I stand in awe and admiration of your surgical skill. But the really great day will come when you build me a ductus for a cyanotic child and not when you close a ductus for a child who had a little too much blood going to the lungs. Mm -hmm. And he gave a sigh. He really thought he'd done something. Then he said to me, when that day comes, this will seem like child's play. As time went on, once Thomas had a clear understanding of Blue Baby Syndrome, he began his research. To conduct his experiments, he would test operations on animals. 
In the early 1900s, Thomas and Blaylock had completed experimental surgery on hundreds and hundreds of dogs and other small animals. Thomas had no veterinarian experience, but he found a way to recreate blue baby syndrome in the dogs. Once symptoms began to appear, he would then perform the procedure on the animals to see if there were any results. Various groups have been trying for years to prevent medical research from being completed on dogs. Anti-vivisectionists protested up and down the streets to fight against the inhumane treatment of animals. He considered the arguments of the protesters and understood their reasons for being upset. However, he believed that the medical advancements would not have been possible without the vital animal testing. With the technique for the procedure almost being completed, he needed to get the surgical tools he needed. In the 1940s, there were only a few commercial manufacturers that made surgical tools, especially ones small enough for Thomas to operate on a small child. He began to study all the tools that he would need for the operation and found ways to improve and make them more successful. Then it happened, in 1944, Thomas discovered how to connect the subclavian artery to the pulmonary artery using a suture as small as a wire. After watching Thomas's exceptional skills, Blaylock mumbled that his work was so close to perfection that it might have been something the Lord had made. They then waited for their time to perform the surgery. On November 29, 1944, Elaine Saxton was rushed into Johns Hopkins with a severe case of blue baby syndrome who was 12 pounds underweight with a sick blue tint to her skin. Gasping for air, she seemed on the verge of heart failure. Blaylock was unprepared, yet he had to perfect the procedure. He insisted that he should not operate, but Tossig thought differently. Due to lack of schooling and racial influences, Thomas was not allowed to conduct medical procedures, let alone be in the operating room. However, as the operating room was being prepared, Blaylock called to one of his assistants and said, I guess you better go call Vivian. Blaylock was incredibly insecure about the procedure and needed Vivian by his side answering any questions he might have. Dr. Cooley, another doctor in the operating room, remembered Blaylock asking, Should I do it this way or that way? And Vivian would instantly respond knowing the answer. After the surgery was completed, the color suddenly began to reappear back in a little Elaine Saxton's cheeks. Her sick blue lips turned pink, and with that, the operation was a success. As Dr. Tosig had hoped, we, like plumbers, had changed the pipes to get more blood to the lungs. We had found what pipes to put where. Shortly after Elaine's recovery, news reporters wrote about this miraculous recovery in a girl who was once blue but now had a radiant glow. Articles and bold text described it as the Blaylock Tossig shunt, saying that they had saved our doomed blue babies. Doctors from all around the country traveled to Johns Hopkins in hopes of seeing future operations and learning from Blaylock and Thomas. Through all of this, Thomas humbly sat back in the shadows, never claiming the accolades he deserved. Not a word was mentioned about the African-American lab technician that had not only discovered how to perform the surgery, but had taught Blaylock everything he knew. Tossig and Blaylock broke the laws of medicine and were worshipped for their success. They could have easily given Thomas an ounce of credit, but they kept the spotlight on themselves. Vivian Thomas never fulfilled his dreams of becoming a doctor or being honored for his outstanding contributions to the medical advancements. He dedicated his entire life to medicine. He even tried to attend Morgan State University, but the university officials refused to grant him any credit for his life experiences. They said he would have to obtain the standard freshman's requirements. After realizing he would be 50 years old by the time he would complete the schooling, Thomas gave up his lifelong dream. Instead, he decided to recruit nearly three dozen black technicians to continue his legacy. Two of them, including Levi Watkins and Richard Scott, would later on become the first black surgical residents at Johns Hopkins. This paved the way for African Americans so they could play a role in the modern medicine. Vivian Thomas never received the credit he deserved because he was a man of color. Nevertheless, he overcame these tragedies and triumphantly made discoveries such as designing new innovative surgical equipment, making groundbreaking work in toxic shock, and curing blue baby syndrome. In addition, he became an instructor of surgery to technicians and doctors in the cardiovascular field. 
Ultimately, his efforts saved not hundreds, but millions of lives. Thomas defied limitations society placed in front of him. He accomplished above and beyond what he was predicted to do. Thomas had done the impossible. He had conquered. He had triumphed. I had always taken my activity in life as a personal matter, yet now I begin asking questions. Was my story worth the effort? Would others really be interested? Vivian Thomas